Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. If this is your first time seeing my face, I am Jalisa, your friendly neighborhood lawyer. And for all my returning subscribers, welcome back my alien allies. It's nice to have you here. Today is episode four of our Alien in the Courtroom series, a series aimed at helping young entrepreneurs and business professionals at making better legal decisions for their brands. Episode four, we are talking about protecting the overall look and feel of your brand, whether it's clothing or music, um, or maybe even retail, food. We're gonna talk about a lot of different examples in this video, and we're covering trade dress. It's a concept you might not have heard before, maybe you have, but it's basically a subcategory of trademark law. So if you would like to learn a little bit more, or at least the intro to trademark law, you should definitely check out episode one of this series where I discuss the differences between trademark law, uh, copyright, and patent law. Definitely a good video. You should check that out first and then come back here and learn a little bit more about trademark law. But I decided to do this video because I've seen a lot of examples of trade dress lately. Uh, the first example that I can think of was I think the name of the shop is The Lash Pharmacy. There was this viral tweet going around of this woman that was selling eyelashes in a prescription pill bottle. Another example of this is the Popeyes versus Beyonce fiasco. Uh, if you didn't know that Popeyes started selling clothes at Leisure Line that is pretty similar to Beyonce's Ivy Park line, the collection that is out right now. So that can be a possible example of trade dress. Then another example that I saw is that Glossier is actually trying to file a trade dress claim for the pink pouches that their makeup actually is delivered to customers in. So today's video is really about protecting those unique elements of your brand and what goes into your branding so that other people are not able to steal your hard work and creativity. As always, it is important that I stress that these videos are intended for educational purposes only. In no way should you consider me to be your own personal lawyer. And if you have any specific legal questions that are very specific to your brand, you should definitely consult a lawyer. But otherwise, if you have a legal question, please feel free to leave it down below and I will do my best to answer them or redirect you to consult a lawyer if needed. And with all of that being said, let's get into the video. Trade dress. Trade dress is a type of trademark law that extends to the configuration, meaning the design and shape of a product itself. It may include such features as size, shape, color, color combinations, texture, graphics, or even particular sales techniques. So trade dress is really just the total impression that you get from a particular product or service. This could be the product itself. It could be the packaging that surrounds the product. It can be what the customer service experience is like, the flow of the experience, maybe the way that you order whatever product or service, maybe the way that you pay the bill for the product or service. It can even be the layout of your store. So for a restaurant, for example, you want to think about the shape and the general appearance of the exterior of the restaurant. You want to think about the sign outside the restaurant, the interior kitchen and floor plan, the decor, the menu, the equipment used to serve the food, the server's uniform, and other features that just present the overall package of the restaurant. So you can think about a McDonald's restaurant or a Popeye's restaurant, and you know that the exterior always has the big M on the outside. You know that when you go inside, everything is pretty much red and yellow. The menu layout is the same exact way uh the menu is the same the layout is the same but you know that there are specific unique elements of a mcdonald's that makes it a mcdonald's no matter what no matter the city that's what a mcdonald's is going to look like the same applies to any clothing store you want to think about the structures and fixtures that are inside a usual forever 21 and you should expect to see those same things in every forever 21 across the country and building off of that restaurant scenario i'm thinking about 
the sprinkles vending machine. I think that was my first time experiencing a vending machine that was putting out something other than just candy and chocolate bars and chips. I think that was my first time seeing a vending machine that was putting out cupcakes. Like, and it was so unique and different. And I feel like that Sprinkles cupcake vending machine could have been practically a part of their trade dress because they were known for it. And it's funny because last night on Twitter, I saw this tweet about these three sisters who are using a vending machine to supply eyelashes as well. So that can be unique trade dress. I don't think there's any other brand that is doing eyelashes in a vending machine, but to think that there are other more unconventional products being sold in a vending machine now, because now we have the cupcakes, now we have eyelashes, who knows what else is being sold in vending machines. Oh, at the airport you'll have like, um, iPod chargers or like iPhones and stuff inside the vending machine. So I guess maybe it's becoming a little popular, but imagine if you were the first person to come up with that idea, it would be a strong case for a good trade dress claim. So trade dress is just a really broad concept that covers a lot of different things, but it's product packaging and product design. Trade dress is less likely to be registered with the USPTO compared to trademark, um, probably because it's really difficult to define what a trade dress is. When you're making that application, you really have to be precise and specific about what your trade dress is. And sometimes people leave things out of that application and sometimes people want to leave areas for their brand to grow and develop new branding or new techniques that wasn't mentioned before in the earlier trade dress. So it's not exactly very common, but when it is registered, it can be a really good thing because it makes sure that your brand looks like no one else. And even with your trade dress being unregistered, there's no problem with suing over trade dress. You're still able to sue another brand for taking your trade dress. Trade dress must be distinctive which means that customers are able to recognize that trade dress as belonging to only one source being your brand and it has to be non-functional. So trademark law in general, whenever you have something that is functional to the brand or functional to how a product works or functional to how the service works, that usually bars a trademark law claim, meaning that you can't trademark that thing. So it has to be non-functional. It cannot be essential to the use or the purpose of the product or service, and it cannot affect the cost or quality of the product or service. You cannot have a monopoly on the quality or the cost of a product in trademark. So how does this help your brand? Let's talk about it. If you're thinking about protecting unique aspects of your design, of your brand, if you develop something really unique, how do you know that you are onto something worth protecting? How do you know that your brand's secret sauce is so valuable that you should probably consult a lawyer for a trade dress application? There are two tests that you should consider. The first test we talked about in episode two, which was about the strength of your mark, building a strong business name. And I talked to you about the spectrum of marks, which was like a password strength. Whether your mark is generic, descriptive, suggestive, arbitrary, or fanciful, and you wanna stay in the arbitrary and fanciful categories as we discussed before. But secondly, when it comes to product packaging and design, courts also look to the Seabrook test. These are some questions that you can ask yourself to determine how unique your brand is. And you don't have to pass all of these factors but having a good amount is a good indication that you have something that is valuable and in need of protection think about whether the trade dress is a common basic shape or design whether the trade dress is unique or unusual in the field whether it is a mere refinement of a commonly adopted and well-known form of ornamentation merely refining something that already exists isn't exactly that distinct or unique. And whether it is capable of creating a commercial impression distinct from accompanying words. Uh, trade dress usually applies to things that are, are non-words. Um, we're not talking about names like trademarks. We're talking about non-word things, which are product design and product packaging. And it wants to make sure that the product design or packaging is so strong that it can stand on its own without a mark or without a name or word attached to it. 
A popular example that applies this test is the Klondike Bar case in the case of Ambrit Inc. versus Kraft Inc. Ambrit Inc., who owns the Klondike Bar, was accusing Kraft of stealing its trade dress of the Klondike Bar. And it described its trade dress as the following, wrapped in pebbled foil featuring the colors silver, blue, and white since the 1940s. The wrapper has featured a three by three inch panel of silver, white, and blue, the words Islay and Klondike, and the figure of a polar bear. Kraft's polar bar had the same three by three pebbled silver foil panel with a white polar bear standing on all fours contained within a colored triangle in the bottom right corner. The court looked at the traditional test of distinctiveness that was discussed in episode two. So looking at the traditional test, the court found that the overall appearance of the Klondike bar was arbitrary or suggestive. The colors, for example, blue and silver could be associated with ice and being cold. Bar packaging was at least arbitrary or suggestive of it being related to ice cream. As for the second test, the Seabrook test, Kraft attempted to argue that the elements of circles and the colors of blue and silver are all common, that they're not an inherently distinctive color. But the counter argument was that the arrangement of all of it together, the overall impression was inherently distinctive. It gave the packaging its distinctiveness. The circles, the blue, the silver, the polar bear, all of that made a Klondike bar recognizable to consumers. And the court agreed. It found that the combination was unique and unusual. And separately, that these items would be common and they wouldn't indicate a certain brand. But to put them together and arrange them in such a way and for the, that company, Klondike, to be in business since the 1940s and conducting their trade dress in this way, all of those were in Klondike's favor. Being original is always a better use of your time. Think outside the box. Distinguish your brand from other competitors. Come up with something that's so unique and uncommon in your industry that your brand is instantly recognizable by consumers as belonging only to you that brings us to the end of this video thank you for watching make sure you give it a like if you enjoyed it share it with an entrepreneur if you haven't already and um subscribe please do subscribe we're working on building this channel and hopefully this is content that you find valuable so share like subscribe and i'll talk to you guys in the next video bye